Welcome everyone uh, to 11737. Uh, this is a multilingual natural language processing and it will be uh, run by me and Ellen Black and Shinji Watanabe. And uh, we're, we're going to be covering all aspects of, uh, you know, natural language processing from a multilingual perspective. And I am waiting for Ellen to come in. Uh, I don't know if he's here. Oh, no, yes, we... I am here. Okay, there we go. Great. Sorry, I, I didn't see you. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get started. And um, I, I also wrote this on Zoom, but just be aware that we're uh, like recording the the Zoom session, and uh, probably will post it uh, publicly so others can benefit from it. So I just know that if you ask a question, that that might be recorded. If you don't want it that to be recorded, you can ask a question via chat or we'll also have a discussion session after each class uh, where we won't be recording things. So um, uh, you can be aware of that too. Uh, great, so uh, I will jump right into the class. So as the title here says, uh, multilingual natural language processing. And the reason why we're interested in multilingual natural language processing is, you know, in other classes, uh, that I teach like 11711, most of the time uh, when we talk about NLP, a great amount of our work, not all of it, is on English processing, basically. So we say natural language, but what we actually mean is English. However, there's many, many languages in the world, uh, you know, estimates say between 6,500 to 7,000, uh, depending on, you know, where you draw the boundaries or, you know, depending on how many of these languages uh, still have a significant number of speakers, if any at all. Uh, but basically, there's a huge amount of languages, huge amount of linguistic diversity throughout the world, and it'd be great if we could create systems that allow us to process all of them. In addition, uh, when I talk about languages, what exactly a language is isn't clear, right? Uh, so we say English, but the English I speak is very different from you know, many of the Indian English speakers. Uh, here, uh, Australian English speakers, British English speakers, and uh, speakers from South Africa. So we all speak the same language. We're all kind of mutually intelligible, but we have very different ways of pronunciation. We have very different uh, terms for some things, like you know, truck versus lorry, or elevator versus lift, uh, or even uh, if you go all the way to Singapore, for example, uh, there's even kind of different uh, varieties of grammar and, and things like this. So, um, you know, lots of variety even within what we consider a single language. So another thing to think about is uh, consider how we build NLP systems. And, you know, a very long time ago, you know, 40 years ago or something like this, uh, it was very standard to build rule-based NLP systems, where basically what we would do is we would come up with a uh, rules that were written out in, you know, a Perl program, a Python program, a C++ program. And these rules would be entirely devised by a linguist who knew the language under consideration. And in some cases, for some applications, these actually work pretty okay. Like, so for example, language generation still mostly uses rule-based systems with templates and other things like this. Um, however, they require lots of human effort, uh, especially for more complex tasks. And they require effort for each language for which they are developed. And of course, you know, most people in this class are very familiar with machine learning-based systems, or at least know that uh, most of NLP runs on machine learning based systems now. And these work really well when lot of, lots of data is available, but they also require that data is available. And if no data is available whatsoever, then they don't work, of course. So basically, um, we're looking at two different methodologies here. The rule based methodology is relying on a scarce resource, human expertise. The machine learning based systems are requiring uh, data, which also is a scarce resource in many scenarios. In many languages, we don't have a whole lot of it. So because of this, we are, uh, you know, we run into similar problems that, you know, it's hard to even uh, create these, um, uh, these models as well. 
So machine learning models, uh, what we're talking about uh, is something formally that maps an input X into an output Y. And in the you know, case of uh, NLP, uh, usually the input X or the output Y will be text. So if you uh, took 11711 with me, you're familiar with this, but basically we have input text, X being text, output Y being text in another language, which corresponds to translation, uh, input X being text, output Y being a response corresponds to dialogue, um, input X being speech and a transcript is speech recognition, um, and input X being text, and output Y being linguistic structure, this would be language analysis. So basically, you know, if we want to build a machine learning model, uh, we need an appropriate way to represent our input, an appropriate way to generate our output in an appropriate data set that consists of, you know, at least some inputs and outputs uh, or something, you know, related to the inputs and outputs in order to uh, train the model well. And to learn, uh, we can use paired data, including um, uh, both the inputs and outputs, source data, uh, which includes only the input. So that could be something like monolingual text or target data, uh, which also could be something like monolingual text. Another really salient uh, thing that we need to be able to do for multilingual learning or uh, cross-lingual learning is we can use paired source and target data uh, in similar languages. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about language similarity in this uh, class starting today and continuing in a few lectures. And this is a really powerful tool in allowing us to uh, generalize to new languages where we don't have lots of data in that language itself. So this is just one example of uh, the long tail of data. And um, this is another interesting, um, or this is an interesting chart from Wikipedia that I calculated myself. It's basically the number of articles in Wikipedia compared to the language rank. And basically what you can see is after the first 10, you know, English has uh, 60, let's see, that's 6 million articles on Wikipedia. Um, and then the number of articles per language quickly drops after you get outside of English. Uh, this uh, second language here, does anyone have a, a guess what this is? If, if you don't know already, you're never going to get it right, but, uh, but you can try. Chinese. Chinese. Good, good guesses, everyone. Uh, we have lots of guesses for high resource languages. Uh, actually, the answer is Cebuano, uh, which is definitely not a high resource language. And uh, the reason why uh, number two is Cebuano is because some Swedish software engineer wrote a bot to generate Wikipedia articles in Cebuano for every municipality in the world and every, uh, every like, animal or plant in the world. So there's all these uh, bot generated articles for Cebuano. So, uh, you know, <laughs> you would never guess that that would be number two, but it also highlights a problem that even if you have lots of data uh, for some languages very often, it's kind of like low, uh, low quality as well. Um, so uh, there's actually a, um, Another paper that just came out uh, recently, let's see if I can find it uh, very, uh, very quickly. And um, it, it's from Google where they also outline the, um, the amount of training data that they are able to find in the languages that they process. Um, it just came out of a uh, like week or two ago. And uh, if you can see this here, um, this is the amount of uh, multilingual data that they have for certain languages. So you can see that after you get down past the first hundred languages or so, uh, they're able to get, uh, I, I'm guessing this is probably sentences, they're able to get somewhere on the order of uh, maybe a million sentences of training data for the top 100 languages. And then 
uh, as you get down to you know 200 languages or so, they still have um, 10 million sentences in those languages. So uh, monolingual data, they, there's certainly more monolingual data than there is bilingual data. Um, but you can see that this drops off. And this is on a log scale. So you can see that English and kind of the, the top highest resource languages are, uh, you know, have much, much more data than all of the others, uh, exponentially more data. Let me put this in the Zoom, the Zoom chat in case anyone wants to look. So um, how do we cope with this? Uh, we can do that through uh, better models or algorithms. So sophisticated modeling and training algorithms. Uh, in order to do this, you need to know like uh, natural language processing and machine learning, and we'll be talking about things like that. Um, also more uh, linguistically informed methods. Uh, that means we need to know linguistics. Um, we can also do it through better data. So every piece of relevant data for a task in a low resource language can help. Uh, and how we acquire this data requires us to be resourceful. And we'll talk about what good ways of gathering data. Um, we can also make data if necessary. So um, if you want to work on a particular language, it helps to be connected uh, to you know, people who know the language and can help you out. And um, you know, different situations require different solutions. So every situation is going to be unique based on the task that you want to tackle and the language you're interested in. It's, uh, some, you know, it's current situations. So uh, you need to be aware of uh, how to basically map from whatever situation you're interested in into the most appropriate solutions for that uh, situation. Um, I had a good question. Uh, when we say bilingual data, do we mean parallel data generated or curated by human experts? And uh, Ellen answered, mostly curated by humans. Um, it could be parallel data generated automatically, but that usually isn't counted in these sorts of counts because you would need to, um, you know, it's going to be less diverse. It's going to be stilted or, or things like that. So, yeah. So this class will cover a lot of things. Um, it will cover things like linguistics, including things like typology, orthography, morphology, syntax, language contact and change and code switching. Um, and actually, sorry, I missed phonology there as well, which is probably important for speech. Um, also uh, data annotated and unannotated sources, data annotation, linguistic databases, active learning. And uh, tasks like language identification, sequence labeling, translation, speech recognition and synthesis, and syntactic analysis. Um, we'll also cover some of the societal considerations like ethics and the connection between language and society. And this is really important, um, especially in some multilingual contexts, because when we're talking about language, it's very easy to think about it in the abstract as you know, something that we are uh, you know, we're treating as a computational object in some cases, but language is fundamentally used as a method of communication between humans. And so humans, it's a very important part of people's lives. And especially if you're talking about low resource languages um, or languages that have been historically oppressed by people or uh, by you know, colonizers or things like this, this can be an important uh, ethical issue about who owns the language and other things like that as well. Um, and the idea is uh, by the end of the class, we'd like you to be able to build a strong uh, functioning language system in a low resource language that you do not know. Um, with the idea being that if you can do it in a language that you don't know, you'll be able to do it even better in a language that you do know. So um, uh, that's kind of the goal of the class. So that's a high level motivation. Are there any uh, questions about that before I move on into a, kind of an overview of what we're gonna cover? Okay, um, I, I will move on. So uh, we're training multilingual NLP systems. Uh, one very important part of this is data creation and curation. And the first step is obtaining curated training data in the language that you're interested in. And what I mean by curated 
is basically it's in the form in a form that you can use easily, uh, not random PDFs uh, that were scanned in the 1950s uh, somewhere on the internet because that's hard to you know feed into your uh, Fierce machine translation model. So uh, we need to think about like what types of data we'll be using, uh, monolingual, uh, multilingual, or annotated uh, data. So it could be text, it could be multilingual text aligned or uh, annotated data with whatever you know, linguistic features or uh, annotations you want to predict. Also, where can you uh, get it? Can you get it from uh, annotated data sources like, uh, you know, there's a whole industry of NLP papers where people have gone in and done some variety of interesting annotation on text, usually English text, um, so that you could be using. But unfortunately, uh, you know, most of these wonderful like common sense reasoning data sets or numerical question answering data sets or whatever the popular thing that people are creating uh, for ACL 2022-2023 uh, is. Uh, don't exist in, in most of the languages in the world. Um, another thing is curated text collections. So how can we get text in that language and uh, or do we need to scrape it on our own from, uh, from the internet? Can we create data? Um, how can we efficiently uh, create high quality data? Um, so uh, efficient, uh, Efficient is important, but high quality is equally important. It's particularly difficult uh, to create high quality data in you know, languages that don't have lots of trained linguists or where you don't necessarily know the language. So uh, we're going to be talking about some of those things as well. And uh, ethical issues like working with communities language ownership, like I mentioned before. Um, there was a question, what's the difference between multilingual data and annotated data? Um, so you can. Annotated data is basically where a human annotator has gone in and written something on the data or like given some sort of uh, you know, information on the data in addition to the original text itself. Um, so uh, to give an example, uh, like part of speech tag to corpora. So somebody has gone in and read the text and assigned a part of speech tag to each. Um, uh, to each word. Another example would be named entity recognized corpora, named entity tagged corpora, or question answering corpora, where you've annotated it with annotated a, an existing text with a question and the appropriate answer for that. Uh, so these would all be multi annotated. Uh, that's an orthogonal access to multilingual. So you can have a multilingual annotated data set as well. So um, uh, multilingual just means in multiple languages. Um, can I give an example of a text uh, of a task that is only applicable to some languages? Uh, I think that's an interesting question. I don't think there are many tasks that are only applicable to some languages. Um, there are some tasks that are kind of trivially easy in some languages, like um, pronunciation estimation is trivially easy in languages where the pronunciation exactly matches the, uh, the orthography. Um, morphological analysis for Chinese is not very hard because Chinese has basically no morphology. Um, so th there are some cases where the typological features of the language basically uh, mean that there is no need to do that task, but I think most NLP tasks are applicable to most languages. Very good question. Um, so once we have a data set, uh, we apply multilingual training techniques, um, and we're going to be talking about lots and lots of these. So it's kind of a central focus of the class. Um, so one way we can do this is by training a, a large multilingual uh, NLP system by feeding in lots of uh, data. This would be an example like of a translation system from many languages into English. Um, and there's lots of challenges in doing this that we'll need to tackle. Uh, so for example, how to train effectively, how to ensure representation of low resource languages, uh, other things like this. So we, um, another uh, thing that we're going to talk about is transfer learning. So basically we train on one language and then transfer to another. 
or train on many languages and transfer to another. So this is like a special variety of multilingual learning where we really care about one language in particular, and we would really like to improve accuracy there. So if you're working um, for the government of Azerbaijan, uh, they might really care about your Azerbaijani to English or English to Azerbaijani translation. So they don't care if you're doing really well on French to English translation. They just want you to maximize accuracy. And that's where kind of a transfer, um, you know, focused transfer approach is useful. And we'll talk about methods to do that as well. Another really popular variety of transfer is training on unannotated data and transferring to supervised tasks. And that's useful for precisely the reason that I talked about uh, before in the Google uh, paper where you can get more, uh, you know, monolingual data or especially more uh, textual data than annotated data. Uh, so uh, that's an important topic. So um, another thing that we're going to talk about is multilingual uh, learning kind of from a linguistic perspective. And um, uh, an important concept here is typology. And what typology does is it basically uh, says that languages across the world have similarities and differences. And uh, typology is kind of the practice and the result of organizing languages along multiple axes. So to give a couple examples of this, um, one way you can organize languages is according to the script that they use. And this is really, really important in NLP because, for example, it's much easier to transfer across languages that use the same script uh, just because you know words that are pronounced the same way uh, tend to have similar meanings in related languages. And uh, if they're written the same way, then it's easier to tell if they're pronounced the same way. Uh, there's many, many different scripts in the world. Of course, the most common one is Latin script, which we're all familiar with and using right now. Um, there's also Cyrillic, Arabic, um, you know, Chinese. Uh, in Japan, they use katakana, kana, and kanji. Many, many different scripts in, uh, in India, in the various languages uh, around India and South Asia in general. Um, and then there's some other scripts that you've likely not even, uh, you know, most people here have not heard about before, like Cree or Cherokee um, or uh, things like this. Another one is phonology. So how is the language pronounced? Um, and uh, this is probably very salient to you if you learned English as a second language speaker. English has many, many vowels, many, many vowel sounds in it. Uh, whereas many other languages, this is an example from Farsi, which really only has six vowel sounds. And um, so uh, the ways the vowels are pronounced are diff different. And like, if you want to learn English from Farsi, uh, then you're gonna have to learn a lot of new vowel sounds. And that makes it kind of difficult to learn English. Um, also, even if, uh, Farsi has only six vowel sounds that might be slightly different or even very different vowel sounds from Japanese, which has five vowel sounds. Um, so, uh, you know, phonology is basically how do we um, how do we pronounce words and how does that interact with other parts of the language? Morphology and syntax. So uh, what is the system of word formation? And syntax is how our words brought together to make sentences. So um, if we look at uh, this morphology here, English has very simple morphology. So she opened the door for him again. Um, the only real kind of thing that happened in word formation here is the, the lemma open got a suffix opened and that turned uh, open into the past tense. Um, if we look at Japanese, which is an agglutinative language that has more morphology, uh, here we have akite ageta, which means uh, open the door for him, basically. It, and so all of this is expressed in a single, uh, in a single word. And then we have uh, a polysynthetic language, which basically means very, very rich morphology. And in Mohawk, she opened the door for him again is one word, basically. So all of this is expressed in the suffixes uh, that you add into the uh, add into the language. And there's 
uh, interesting interactions between morphology and syntax also. Like uh, morphology, morphologically rich languages uh, tend to have certain syntax and, and vice versa. Syntax is how words are brought together to make sentences. So as we know in English, uh, the stereotypical word order for English or the major word order for English is uh, subject, verb, object. Um, in Japanese, uh, it's subject, object, verb. Um, in other languages like Irish or Arabic, it's uh, verb, subject, object, like this. And um, in other uh, languages like Malagasy, it's verb, object, subject. Uh, and of course, this is not the only, you know, this is not the only order we use. We use other orders in English as well, but, um, you know, uh, in lots of other features you can define here, but this is kind of an important salient element of, of the languages. There's also language varieties, contact and change. So languages contact uh, one another and gradually evolve. Um, this is a beautiful illustration of a, a language family tree that some people might have seen before. Uh, this is the Indo-European language family and all of the languages that split off uh, from it. So like Hin Hindi, uh, English, Italian, Spanish, uh, Punjabi, Kurdish, all have split off at uh, different times, uh, but they all have a common ancestor. Uh, there's a lot of language families in the world. The Indo-European is the biggest one, most widely spoken one, but there's also other ones like Uralic, um, uh, which includes things like Finnish and Hungarian and uh, other things like that. And there's similarities in structure like syntax between similar languages and language families, uh, but more salient is the similarity in words. So in Proto-Indo-European, uh, there was this word over here that split off into all these other words like the English too, all the way uh, over to you know, Hindi languages, uh, Hindi words and other words like this. So because all the languages are related to each other, uh, this results in, you know, uh, essentially similarities between the languages that we can exploit for learning uh, multilingual NLP systems as well. Um, and another thing we're gonna be talking about in the class is multilingual applications. So uh, we're going to be talking um, in, about sequence labeling and classification, uh, like language ID, part of speech tagging, name entity recognition, entity linking, uh, with sequence encoders and subword encodings. And um, we're going to be talking about data uh, from universal dependencies, part of speech tags, uh, Wikipedia-based uh, name entity recognition and linking, and other things like this. And how can we get multilingual data for all of these uh, important tasks? Uh, we'll be talking about morphology and syntactic analysis. So how can we take this Hui uh, you know, polysynthetic word, and break it down into an analysis like this that tells us um, you know, what each of these segments means, what part of speech it is, uh, things like this. And syntactic analysis covers things like dependency parsing and uh, you know, phrase structure parsing. And I'm particularly interested in these as applications, not you know, because we all love staring at morphological analyses and parse trees, uh, all day, you know, it's not like question answering or um, or machine translation things that are immediately useful. But rather, I'm excited about them from the point of view of being able to, you know, create a grammar textbook for an under-resourced language or help linguists with their linguistic inquiry about, uh, you know, how the languages in uh, the whole world si are similar or different or things like this. So, from that point of view, I think it's very interesting as an application. We're also going to talk about machine translation and sequence sequence models. So um, sequence sequence problems can be all kinds of different uh, problems like the ones I talked about uh, before. And we're gonna be talking about, you know, sequence sequence models with attention, transformers. And also if you took 11.7.11, we're going to be going into a bit more detail about kind of advanced methods for machine translation than we covered there. Uh, because, you know, machine translation is one of the mo more important uh, you know, multilingual tasks, um, and also low resource considerations. Um, and for modeling challenges, uh, we have multilingual sharing of structure vocabulary. 
uh, balancing training over many languages, doing efficient transfer between languages, and incorporating various varieties of the supervision we do have for low resource languages. So these are going to be very important topics in the class as well. So are there any questions on this here? Uh, if not, I'll turn it over to Shinji for speech and we'll see have some time to ask questions at the end, hopefully, if you if you're interested. I'll stop my share for now. Okay. Um, I, I don't see any questions. So Shinji, if you want to go. Sure. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. And also just, I want to test the audio is working. Welcome to the multilingual NL P course. It does sounds okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we could hear it. Uh, it's obviously it's not my voice. It comes from the TDS. Okay, I briefly explained about uh, the speech lecture part in this multilingual uh, NLP. Welcome to. Yeah. And the uh, this is a kind of uh, the schedule. Uh, actually, uh, the that we. Uh, that have uh, five courses for mainly uh, the dealing with speech, but of course some of the other important speech applications and so on are uh, in the other part of the lectures. But this, the five lectures from the uh, March 1st to March 15th, uh, we intensively uh, introduce the speech uh, technologies. And the first part, uh, we uh, first uh, introduce some basic speech. Uh, what is speech? And I will also e explain about the various speech applications. And the which uh, the we will also uh, the, uh, give uh, the, the more uh, the, the introduction to the uh, toward the other other uh, courses in the speech courses. And they, we also uh, release assignments here in the March cross, which is also related to speech. And the next part. Uh, uh, that I will explain about the, the automatic uh, speech recognition. And the, 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 after the uh, automatic speech recognition, uh, I will also explain about sequence to sequence models. However, this is a little bit more customized to the speech uh, processing. There are some overlap uh, in the, uh, the machine translation part, but I will try to emphasize the difference, uh, how we customize it for the speech problem and we'll cover uh, the sequence to sequence based ASR and TTS. And uh, the Professor Aram Brack uh, will also uh, introduce a text to speech uh, the, the in general. And then the last part of the lecture of the speech part, I will try to introduce the various uh, multilingual uh, ASR uh, and the TTS systems. And in the technically, there are a lot of overlaps uh, with the multilingual uh, the, the uh, translation and other uh, techniques for low resource or transfer learning uh, and so on. Uh, but again, the, the, I will try to emphasize the problem, uh, the, the use for uh, the speech recognition uh, and the TTS problems. And I think this can be uh, quite obvious now, but the, 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 I will explain about what is speech recognition. Uh, automatic speech recognition input is speech and the output is corresponding text. And uh, nowadays, actually there are a lot of uh, the speech recognition applications. So I'm happy that I don't have to introduce so much, but it used to be even speech recognition uh, is not a uh, general term. And uh, I have to spend uh, some of the time to explain what is speech recognition and so on. And here, uh, the, the, I listed some of the, uh, the, the, the applications, products. But in CMU, we actually uh, developed a lot of speech technologies, speech recognition uh, technologies, uh, and so on. So in addition to the other uh, contribution to the, uh, the, the research, CMU are actually also leading the technology side, open source side in the speech recognition. And I would like to actually uh, show you the demonstration uh, of the speech recognition. Uh, can you see the, uh, the Google crop? I think so. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. And uh, 
Uh, this is actually the tool that we are maintaining, ESPNet, and I checked just using the Google prop of that. And this will be also uh, used for our assignment. So it will be good if you guys know this uh, the, the tools a little bit. But of course, we will explain it later uh, in the assignments uh, the phase. And here, I want to give you some example of the speech recognition. And I prepared a couple of models uh, English, Japanese, Spanish, Mandarin. And uh, the last one is the multilingual ASR. It actually can accept uh, 52 languages. Although the, some of the languages, the performance is not very good, but at least uh, the, the, it's potentially can recognize 52 languages. And today, uh, the, since uh, the, my uh, the main language is Japanese, so I kind of make a demonstration based on the, the Japanese. I just, you know, uh, the uh, choose the Japanese uh, as a, a model and the download and so on, model download and so on takes time. So I already kind of skip, uh, I already uh, did it in our, uh, uh, in advance. And uh, let's do some demonstration. Kyo wa yuki ga futta. It's actually the first part is cut, so I will record it again. Kyo wa yuki ga futta. This is recorded. Kyo wa yuki ga futta. And hope it to be recognized. So this is a sentence. And I believe many of them uh, cannot know the, the Japanese, but please trust me, actually, this is perfectly recognized. Graham, Alan, I, they, <laughs> yes, right. They actually know the Japanese, so that, uh, please uh, trust us that my, uh, the, uh, the, the, ing, uh, the Japanese is correctly pronounced, and also the, this system correctly uh, they, uh, recognized uh, my speech. Okay, this is a speech recognition. And the next part, uh, it's uh, the TTS. That is also the, the covering, uh, covered uh, by our lecture. And this is a kind of an inverse problem of ASR. Given the text uh, to produce the, uh, the uh, natural uh, human sound, and uh, similar to the ASR, uh, the, in addition to many success uh, in the, uh, the TTS uh, the, uh, product, uh, CMU is actually one of the, uh, the, 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 the quite active uh, the, the institute that also uh, develop uh, various uh, tools, various open source tools, and maintain them. So that uh, I think that uh, you guys have a great experience of not only studying uh, the uh, TTS technique itself, but also the technology uh, system that we are developing. Okay, so now I uh, move to the remarks. Uh, oh, maybe I it's better to uh, give you some demonstration of the TTS uh, because I prepared as well. So TTS, uh, the, I actually using the same uh, the, uh, system demonstration at uh, ESPNet toolkit. And the, I, we have our, uh, the, actually uh, the three uh, the language uh, the, uh, uh, in the option, English, Japanese, uh, Mandarin, and so on. And then I selected the English uh, today. And I finished the model setup already because it takes a time to download the model. And let's do the synthesis. I have to shovel snow today. I have to shovel snow today. There's some kind of a bit uh, the, uh, the the crazy sound happens, but the overall the, the sound uh, okay, right? Uh, the, I will have another example. Multilingual pal. It sounds very weird, right? Actually, the, uh, the, we have to provide that the, the abbreviation correctly. 
It would work. Multilingual NLP. Okay, it's working. So that's the kind of a TTS system. And I have a couple of remarks uh, related to this uh, the, the lecture. So uh, the ASR and the TTS and the related technologies are explained uh, this uh, lectures. But the, the like uh, the, the other uh, NLP part of the courses, uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, it's more like introducing the high-level explanation, uh, introduction, and the system de description of ASR and TTS. So if you want to know more about uh, such kind of technologies, uh, it will be great if you also consider to take the speech recognition uh, and the speech processing courses, where you can find more uh, fundamental and algorithm uh, of uh, these uh, techniques. And CMU is lucky, you know, CMU covers all entire human language technology courses. So you guys, in addition to this multilingual of NLP, you can learn speech recognition, uh, TTS and so on. And the, uh, I also would like to mention that, and it's actually uh, the, similar to the Grams uh, the, the, the remarks, most of ASR and TTS technologies are still studied with major languages. So as you can see from my kind of list of the models, most of the language is a major language, Japanese, Chinese, Mandarin, German, Spanish, and so on, uh, right? And the, this is uh, the, the exactly what Brown mentioned, uh, due to the resources, uh, the know-how, uh, the, the, the marketing uh, the, uh, priorities, and so on, uh, makes the current situations. However, uh, in this multilingual course, uh, we try to uh, the, the, uh, tackle uh, this problem, and uh, we want to actually provide uh, the, what kind of our, uh, the languages, uh, any of the languages uh, you can build uh, the, from, uh, the, based on the uh, ASR and the TTS system uh, in our lecture. So what you can learn uh, from this lecture is exactly like that. I will try to explain how we build a new uh, the ASR and TTS uh, techniques uh, uh, systems for a uh, new language. And actually one of the assignments uh, in assignment three is uh, the, for you guys to pick up one language and uh, uh, collect some data or the using existing data, uh, the whatever is fine. But then building our uh, ASR system, uh, that will be your uh, assignment. And also in this lecture, we did a bit focus on more on the end-to-end -end ASR, but we can also try to cover the other uh, the pipeline uh, techniques in ASR and TTS. And the last slide, one of the ultimate goal of the human language technologies, and I think this is also one of the important uh, the goal in this multilingual NLP course, is uh, to realize a speech-to-speech -speech translation. Uh, this is a kind of a, we can say that combining ASR machine translation and TTS. And note that we don't directly uh, the explain about these technologies, but the, the, uh, the we can definitely providing the explanation instructions of the core technologies of these approaches. So after you guys uh, finish these courses, maybe you can also build a speech-to-speech -speech translation. And since uh, we also have our uh, the, the term project, so if someone is interested in, maybe you can also tackle a speech-to-speech -speech, uh, translation uh, problem. Yeah, that is uh, from my side. Great, thanks a lot. Are, are there any um, are there any questions about this? I think it was relatively uh, relatively. Straightforward, but cool to have the demos. Cool. Um, okay. So I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about logistics um, before we uh, go on uh, to Ellen's part. Um, and so logistics. Uh, first, to introduce the instructors and TAs, uh, we have three instructors and five TAs. So um, Ellen. Uh, Ellen Black is the other instructor. Uh, he'll be talking in a second. 
Um, I, I had trouble guessing uh, what Ellen's research, multilingual research areas were because he does everything, but these are the ones that I've thought of recently, code switching, dialogue, speech synthesis. Um, do you want to add any areas of interest, Ellen? Uh, no, I think that's quite good. I mean, I have to project the things that I'm uh, doing the multilingual aspect, and these are definitely core parts of what I'm doing at the moment. Well, um, and so I, I like to cover just about any part of multilingual NLP. I, I'd like everything we can do in English to be done in any of the other languages. I'm uh, particularly interested in um, machine translation as well, so that's a big part of my research. And I'm, I guess, more and more interested in computational linguistics and um, uh, language, you know, education for endangered languages and other things like this as well. So um, those are kind of my areas. Uh, Shinji talked already, uh, but you know, speech recognition, synthesis, speech translation, anything that has to do with speech, of course. Um, for TAs, uh, we have five uh, excellent TAs. So. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll go through everybody, and if you want to add any anything else about your research interests, you can. Um, so Shuangkai uh, Chang is uh, working on speech recognition. Um, Ting Rui Chang is, uh, has previously worked on machine translation and dialogue in uh, multilingual things. He's worked on several different things. Um, uh, Athia Deviani uh, is uh, working on number processing for speech synthesis. Uh, Patrick uh, Fernandez is working on machine translation and also, I guess, model interpretability related things. And uh, BJ Viswanathan is uh, working on information extraction. So we have a, a pretty wide variety. And for every class, I try to share this with you so you know for your class project which people are the best people to be talking to, basically. Um, so, uh, you know, we can, a, a lot of us can cover other areas as well. So if you don't know who might be the best uh, person to talk to, just reach out to us and we can, we can tell you. Um, oh, uh, what languages do we know um, is an, another important thing. So I am a native English speaker. I, I am fluent in Japanese. I can, I can speak not native, but nearly native level Japanese. I know a little bit of Chinese, Korean, and Spanish, um, uh, enough to read, but not enough to speak well. Um, uh, Ellen or Shinji or any of the other TAs would you like to share? So I speak a form of English called Scots English. I also speak Scots. Um, I also speak Japanese, not as well as Graham, but better than most foreigners. I lived there for years. Um, I can read Chinese, but can't speak it. And I can read most European languages and understand them. And in fact, for many languages, I can work out um, mo more than you would expect. So uh, I actually would not have so many uh, language variations, but probably uh, the, among uh, the, the members here, my Japanese is the best <laughs> in terms of uh, the, the, I am uh, the, I was born and I was uh, the, grew up in Japan. And uh, another thing I want to mention is that uh, yeah, I'm a kind of a typical that I only speak Japanese and English, but can now uh, the work on the, the multilingual processing. So it will be great to have some kind of a language uh, the, the, the experience, uh, the, but the, the, the multilingual techniques, uh, you don't need uh, the, uh, uh, ling the multilingual. Uh, the, the knowledge and ex, uh, the expertise. And I, I liked how Alan also said he speaks the Scots variety of English. So I speak the mid, Midwestern uh, American variety of English, and I speak uh, I speak the Kansai variety of Japanese uh, most of the time. Uh, yes. so. Mine is uh, Tokyo Japanese, yeah. <laughs> so, so let's um, let's also in the chat if people wouldn't mind sharing what uh, what languages are represented in the class, that would be cool to to see. Especially, you know, um, I, I imagine we have a lot of people who speak you know Chinese and Hindi, but if you have any others, uh, uh, particularly uh, less less common ones, that would be really cool too. So we have uh, Kor Korean, Mandarin, Hindi, Marathi, Arabic, Canada, Tamil, French, Russian, Haitian, um, Spanish, Canada, Indonesian, Punjabi, Bengali, Malayal 
um, Portuguese, uh, Latin, Telugu. I'm skipping the ones that are, are duplicated, but uh, yeah, let's see, um, Sanskrit, uh, Spanish. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm sure we have more. Uh, that, that was just people who are uh, uh, who were willing to share. So that's great. Um, I'd also like to talk about the class format next. Um, so the class format here is a little bit of a, um, it, I wouldn't say unusual, but it's not just a purely lecture format. Basically, um, the idea is that we have a shortish lecture, um, you know, maybe 30, 30 to 40 minutes. And um, we, uh, for each lecture, there will be a discussion question that we will try to tell you before the lecture. And also usually a reading that you can read before you come to the lecture to help prime you for the discussion question. And um, the reason why we do this is, um, this is, uh, you know, a class where there's lots of room for creativity, especially, you know, in your final projects and other things like this. So we'd like to give people a, uh, an opportunity to, you know, think deeply and actively about, you know, the questions we have here uh, to uh, get you ready for that. After that, we have a, a very special feature of this class, which uh, is always uh, very interesting called the language in 10. And basically what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have, uh, one group every lecture introduce a language and introduce some of the unique features of it, like the typological features or you know um, uh, just anything you think is interesting. And Ellen is going to give an example of this for Hindi uh, in about five minutes. And um, I wrote in groups of two to three. I'm sorry, this is a mistake. Uh, this was from last time when the class was smaller. Uh, this time the class is larger, so we're actually going to ask you to do it in groups of four so that everybody gets at least one chance to present. Um, and then after we have the language in 10, we're going to do um, the breakout room discussion uh, or something like a code uh, data assignment walkthrough. So um, most of the time we're going to have a discussion, but sometimes we're, we're going to be uh, doing other things. Um, and then in the case that we did a discussion, um, because we're going to break out into breakout rooms or, or groups to do the discussion, um, we're going to have a short summary at the very end where every group talks about maybe one or two interesting things that they uh, came up with that might be kind of unique. Um, I say breakout rooms for Zoom because we'll do that via Zoom, but if we reconvene to an in-person class, um, we will uh, we'll probably just do it by breaking into, into groups in the class. Um, for the grading policy, uh, I have here uh, the class and discussion participation is 15%. Language in 10, everybody's required to do this. Um, there really aren't very many wrong answers. So like as long as you do it, you basically will get 5% as long as you do a good job. Um, and then uh, we have uh, three assignments on multilingual sequence labeling, uh, which is an individual assignment. Uh, then a multilingual translation group assignment, multilingual speech recognition group assignment, and final project, uh, where you, you can kind of uh, do something free form. Um, so for 120, uh, like as I mentioned, every single class we're going to have a discussion uh, period. However, on Thursday, we're not going to have a discussion period because um, on Thursday, the first uh, assignment is going to be assigned. So we're going to have the TAs um, uh, like go through the assignment and, and uh, give you an idea of like what you should be doing and have a Q&A about that. So uh, yeah, that's all uh, we have in terms of logistics for the class. Um, are there any questions that people would like to ask? Uh, and if not, we'll, we'll jump right into Ellen's language. Uh, yeah, when it's not the uh, code work, what is the discussion about usually? So um, one example of a discussion that we might be uh, having soon is um, like, for example, for a class when we talk about language similarity and typology, um, there is a reading about, uh, there might be a reading about transfer, choosing which languages to transfer from in transfer learning, or at least that's what we did last year. Um, that's Alan's class, so I'll let him decide exactly what we do uh, this year. But 
Um, so there's a paper where you'll read about which languages to transfer from and uh, transfer learning. We'll have a, a lecture about uh, kind of similarities between languages. And then in the discussion period, we'd have a discussion about, for example, um, given a language that you know, which languages do you think would be the best languages to transfer from uh, when you're doing a particular NLP task and why? Um, so then you'd have to think, you know, what have I learned about cross-lingual learning? Uh, what have I learned about typology? What do I know about the language that I'm, I'm familiar with? And so which languages would be the best language to transfer from based on this knowledge that I, I got from the class? So that, that's just one example. And then we'd go around in a small group and all discuss this and hopefully that would give you some insights into you know, what other languages look like and, uh, and things like that. Okay, thank you. Great, and I'll stop sharing. So, uh, so. Okay. I think we can see. Looks good. Okay, so this is an example of the language in 10, and I'm going to choose Hindi, and I'm going to use Hindi because I sort of know a little Hindi, and being British, Hindi is one of our non-English languages that's spoken in the UK because of historical reasons that you're probably all aware of. Um, so Hindi, um, it's spoken in northern India. There's about 320 million native speakers. Um, but there's also a substantial number of L2 speakers, non-native speakers, because lots of people in northern India get taught Hindi as a second language, and they're quite fluent at it, and they will use it often. So there's probably almost the same again, uh, L2 speakers. And depending how you count, um, it's somewhere like the third or fourth most commonly spoken language um, on the planet after Mandarin, English, Spanish, depending how you draw the boundary there. So it is a very, very common language on the planet, even though its language technologies is significantly behind. It is a lingua franca of Northern India. So most of the Northern Indians, even though it might not be their um, native language, get taught it at school and are quite fluent in it. It also gets taught in Southern India, but people are not as fluent in Southern India. And in some areas, they might not want to speak it as much because they see it as the Northern language, not the Southern language. India, in case you didn't know, it's full of lots of languages. There are about 20 standard languages through a country. There are hundreds over the whole country. And so each region basically has its own language in it, but really quite distinct in many cases. It's also worth talking about the distinction between Hindi and Urdu. Urdu is mostly, it's the, it's the national language of Pakistan, um, but it's also spoken throughout um, India as well. Um, it is mutually intelligible, so people who speak Hindi and Urdu can talk to each other. They have to be a little careful in choosing their words, but probably no more different in maybe Americans and Brits choosing it, although if you have two Urdu speakers speaking together, maybe a, a Hindi person would not understand what they're saying because they would drift away from what might be considered to be standard Hindi. The writing of these languages, Urdu and Hindi, is completely different. Urdu uses an Arabic script, while Hindi uses a Devanagari script. And although maybe the Urdu speakers can read Devanagari, the reverse is typically not true at all. Hindi has a lot of Sanskrit in it, while um, Urdu is more likely to have Persian and Arabic borrowings in it, and therefore it may be that the Urdu speaker is less understood than the um, a, a Hindi speaker. Sometimes these two languages together are called Hindustani, definitely historically that was the case, and they do share phonology and they do share grammar, so there's some similarity in that language where you can maybe use for speech recognition or speech synthesis at a level that would be useful, but the writing system is not that. Um, Hindi is Indo-European, um, actually Indo-Aryan, and that means that there are things in Hindi that are actually similar with a historical um, relationship with even English, even though they really are very far away. For example, 
uh, Maharaja, which you might have heard of, um, which was a term for a um, major royal in, um, uh, in India, um, actually is a direct cognate of Magnus Royal, great king. Um, and so there is relationships there. And there's a number of things that you find in numbers as well, where um, there's some similarity that you can sort of guess the relationship there. Um, the script not only uses Devanagari, that's a Brahmic script. Um, um, many of the writing systems used in the Indian subcontinent are Brahmi script, and therefore they're similar in the way that they write and break up the syllables. Um, Devanagari itself is also used for Marathi, which is spoken in Mumbai, though there's some characters are different, and Nepali, though there are some characters that are different. So it's maybe a sort of more standard way of writing over the whole of the um, uh, subcontinent. Um, Urdu uses its own form of um, uh, Arabic and therefore is really quite different. Okay. However, often in social media in Hindi, it's written in a Latin script, so it's Romanized. Okay. It's often said it's written in English, um, uh, but it's not written in English, even though it may have lots of borrowed English actually in it. Hindi grammar is mostly um, subject object verb, so it's verb final, uh, but it's often prodropped, so the subject is often not said and it's sort of understood um, in the environment, and that's just fine and normal. English doesn't do that very often, although sometimes it does, um, but in Hindi it's very common. There's gender and all the nouns, um, which is not true in English, but in Hindi it is, and there's agreement between the verbs and um, uh, the um, the nouns. Um, there's quite a rich inflection morphology with agreement and therefore words have different forms depending on what they're agreeing actually with. Um, rather interestingly, it has what's called ergative ma um, marking. Many of the European languages, if they do have agreement, they have agreement between the subject and the verb, but in Hindi and some other um, Indian subcontinent language, the agreement is between the object and the verb. And to Europeans, this is seen as we Weird, but it's not weird at all because it's what the Hindi people actually do. And there's more of them than you, so you should be aware of that. The phonology, there's quite a rich number of um, uh, uh, vowels, but they're different than uh, English. However, because English is quite common in India, it's also a lingua franca, especially over North and South, um, there's actually a number of English um, vowels that have been adopted into Hindi and are just quite normal now. And most people can pronounce them. Not everybody, but most people um, uh, can pronounce them. So in other words, you have not just the native phonology, but you've also got the borrowed English phonology coming into the, um, the language, okay? Um, the phonology is very rich, um, especially with um, consonants. And there's much more distinction between consonants that, for example, in English, we do not have. So, for example, in um, Hindi, they make distinctions between aspirated and unaspirated stops, which we do in English, but we don't actually have a phonological distinction was that is that English native speakers generate them, but we don't really care about the distinction between them. But um, Indian speakers do this, and this often sounds that when they're speaking English, they sound like that there's more example breath coming out when they're actually speaking. Another thing that is very common in um, Hindi, which again doesn't have any equivalent in um, uh, European languages, is what's called retroflex, where the tongue is held a little bit further back in the mouth. And that's one of the things that distinguishes Indian English um, accented English um, compared to um, American or British English. Um, but there are lots of phonological differences. And rather interestingly, some of the non-natives who speak Hindi fluently don't always do this. So many of the Southerners don't do this. And therefore, when they're speaking Hindi, even though they're speaking it fluently, all the Northerners can tell that they're speaking Southern Hindi because they're not doing that in the same way. Um, maybe you're familiar with this in um, 
uh, other things like this in China, where the southern um, Chinese are not doing voicing the same as northern Chinese. That's the same thing that's happening in Hindi. Um, it's worth actually talking about this other form of language that's appearing in um, the Indian subcontinent, and that's what's called Hinglish. It's a mixture of Hindi and English. Um, most educated Hindi speakers are fluent in English. I mean, they're not just can speak English, they're actually completely fluent and may even use it as their primary literate language because since attending maybe middle school onwards, they've been reading and writing in English more than they've been doing that in Hindi. And so what happens when many Hindi speakers are speaking Hindi is they use a lot of borrowed English terms and they'll mix them in this term of being code switching, where they'll basically use two languages at once. And this isn't just like borrowing English words that happens in, say, Japanese, and is very common. This is actually mixing the languages. So you'll get mixed grammar, mixed morphology, um, and choosing different words. Now, code switching is very common in multilingual environments. Most of the planet um, is multilingual, and it's really just um, the Americans and the Brits that are not, and therefore they're not used to it. But code switching is very common to the extent that English might even have become the standard way of speaking Hindi. And you can tease a Hindi speaker by asking them to give a long sentence, which contains Hindi and only Hindi words and has no um, English words in it. Now, there's lots of borrowed words. There's been English in India for over 300 years. So, you know, the word for doctor in um, Hindi is doctor, the word for bus is bus, but um, there are lots of other words that um, on phrases which are actually mixed into Hinglish and they're very common and lots of people do studies on Hinglish as a language in its own right because it's really becoming one of the standard ways that Hindi speakers are actually speaking today. So that's my 10 minute um, Hindi um, presentation. You can see what I'm doing. I'm talking about the language. I'm talking about technical aspects of the language, historical action, uh, um, aspects of the language. I didn't say much about the language technologies of Hindi. It's not very much actually, despite it being the third or fourth spoken language on the planet. Um, it doesn't actually have that much technology. And often when it does, it's all, Devnagari based and not actually Romanized, while actually most people who are writing um, Hindi are Romanizing it when they're sending text messages and writing emails. So I talk about history, geography, social position, because there might be social aspects of how the language fits into the particular country. It might be spoken in many different countries. For example, there is um, Hindi is an official language in Jamaica. It's also an official language in um, Fiji, um, partly because of the British Empire. Um, and the Hindi speakers have moved there, although in those cases, everything is Romanized and they don't use Devnagari at all. I talked about morphology, grammar, um, phonology, which is an interesting thing. And you'll be able to find information about that through Wikipedia or, or elsewhere. I talked about maybe something that's linguistically interesting about the language. Ergative language is something that actually distinguishes it. Code switching is something that distinguishes it. I um, maybe state something about the respect to the resources. How big is the Wikipedia? Have people got morphology? How good is the speech recognition? Do people actually use it um, for interacting with machines? And maybe influences, social uses um, of the language or influences um, on it are things which are sort of interesting and relevant that might be uh, important if you are going to do some sort of language technology for the target language. Now, Hindi is one of the big languages. It might be that you're going to select something that's much less common and therefore harder to be able to find information about, and that's fine too. OK, I know one group is probably going to try to do um, standard Mandarin um, as an example, but don't think that you have to take big languages. We're quite interested in the smaller languages as well. <laughs>